We've dedicated a lot of our attention in History of Comics to mainstream comics, uh, which of course we should since they are mainstream and what most people are going to see. But we need to take a step back and look at the independent comics, these people who aren't mainstream and yet are going to affect mainstream as their readers grow up and become comics creators. Independent comics, by definition, would be ones that aren't dominant in the publishing industry. And depending on how you want to define that, you could say that comic books technically go back further in the independence than they ever do in mainstream publishing. In the late 19th century and into the 20th century, we had what were called Tijuana Bibles. These were pornographic books that people would sell in certain bars or corners of the streets that parts of town you wouldn't go into. Uh, which arguably is publication and is definitely a form of creative art, as Scott McCloud would define it. And these would very much follow the comic strips that were becoming popular in the newspapers. So arguably you could say the first comic books were these Tijuana Bibles. Arguably you'd say, well, they were small publications but not periodicals like we would see with comic books themselves. Either way, uh, they're certainly something to mention, even in the Watchmen comics. They made reference to them with uh, Silk Spectre featured in a Tijuana Bible. We should also talk about the 19th century publication of Punch magazine. So Punch, pulling its name from the famous Punch and Judy shows that you always see in uh, medieval movies, uh, puppets who are beating each other up, uh, these were very popular for centuries, and in fact some places still run them, of uh, making political commentary, uh, funny jokes, coarse jokes, and of course lots of just slapstick violence. Uh, those principles, much like we'd see vaudeville translated into the comics page with gags, would be incorporated into cartoons with Punch producing, just like Daumier and his fellow artists created La Caricature, kind of poking fun at uh, French culture in the 1830s, we had Punch poking fun of the United Kingdom and world culture in the 1860s. And this would go on for many, many years, having political cartoons, so this one here commenting on factory labor. We have uh, skeletons, these people who aren't even alive anymore, working away while the uh, industrialist looks on, very wealthy. And even into the 1960s when we get uh, Punch standing out from the crowd. Punch's use of satire and silliness uh, really inspired a humor magazine coming out of entertaining comics in the early 1950s called Mad, uh, which Mad, of course, is... Uh, just a funny word for a magazine, uh, but also goes back to the Mutually Assured Destruction, this acronym that was come up with for the Cold War, this principle that uh, you can't attack us because we'll destroy you, even though you destroy us too. And it's kind of a weird balance of it. So instead of fearfully looking at that, they're just going to laugh at uh, kind of this dark humor. And with Mad Magazine, uh, we're going to see Harvey Kurtzman with his signature down in the lower left as a, a Kurtz and then a little stick figure guy leading the way in humor. And so we got these very cartoony images, uh, things that you'd see kind of inspired by early Looney Tunes and Disney cartoons, where animals are taken to uh, really ridiculous cartoony extremes, with even more silliness piled on top of that. So here in this page from Pigtails, uh, we see Homer and Hickstaff, and uh, Homer is trying to help his good friend Hickstaff, who's got a cramp, and so he throws him something to hold on to, which is an anchor, just like we had seen with Donald Duck and Goofy uh, fighting each other uh, over fish. But uh, they continue with this kind of silliness. It's not just a one-off, but it's that's everything they do. So here we have their car driving so fast it's jumping off the, the street. Uh, here we have the crowd at the beach so packed that people are pulled upside down. It's completely ridiculous, and people love it. Taking on to satire, we see like Pot Shop Pete. So in these 1950s, the westerns were king, and we had all these uh, great Western heroes, such as the sheriff here, who's not quite so much of a hero. Uh, here we have a guy who literally loves his horse more than he does his girlfriend. And when people hear that two gun zilch is on his way, uh, they start panicking, even to the point of not even getting out of the bathtub, just hopping along to escape. So Mad was very popular, and once EC shut down its comics line, uh, they kind of devoted all of their resources into pushing for this magazine. And Mad would go for over 60 years, uh, even having TV spinoffs, but always doing that pokey fun at what is the cultural moment of the time. So by the 1960s, we had kids who had grown up reading Mad Magazine uh, coming in to do their own art. And this leads us into comics with an X. 
as we can see it here, of Zap Comics. So comics with an X came about as technology improved so that copying things were much easier. So if you wanted to publish something, you could easily put together what's called a zine, uh, the short magazine that's self-published and uh, sold on a very local basis. Those principles were applied to comics with an X in the late 1960s, uh, coming out of the drug culture of San Francisco. And the king of these was a guy named Robert Crumb with his Zack Comics. Crumb had grown up reading Mag Magazine, and his older brother loved comics so much that uh, he wanted to make them at home. And so young Robert Crumb got in on this, and devoured just art as a, as a lifestyle, uh, got into his first job of creating greeting cards, uh, but that wasn't really fulfilling. After meeting some people in drug culture, uh, he moved into San Francisco and really dove into this idea of creating these wacky, weird comics. And uh, while his wife went to work to support them, uh, he would uh, walk them down the street uh, with his baby girl in the baby carriage and sell these comics out of it. You know, stop people and say, hey, you want to buy a comic for 25 cents so I can feed my daughter? Which is hard to say no to that and really caught people's attention because he had actually good writing and this, and this very bizarre Kurtzman style of uh, zany, cartoony characters. Robert Crumb would reach really national and even international fame for his for his keep on trucking image of these guys walking with this kind of weird stance, uh, very strong use of perspective, huge feet, saying keep on trucking, uh, which according to Crumb, uh, he didn't remember creating, it just kind of showed up, and he liked it, so he republished it, and that can be the problem of drug use, is not knowing where it comes from. Uh, and for whatever reason, it latched onto the zeitgeist of America, uh, and everybody kept telling each other, keep on trucking. Crumb continued to develop comics, uh, such as the Adult Fritz the Cat, which is an anthropomorphized animal comic, as you'd see in lots and lots of children's comics in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. Uh, but now they're adults and doing very adult things. So taking things into an angle that readers hadn't really seen before. Another of his creations is Mr. Natural, this guru who has great wisdom, and everybody wants that wisdom from him, even though he doesn't care. Uh, he's not living up on some mountaintop somewhere, because why would you? It's cold. Uh, instead, he just does whatever he wants. And here's an example of where this fellow is being mistreated and wants a certain amount of dignity and respect. Uh, and this lady just tells him, sure, just tell me the secret of the universe. Uh, which, of course, is not how that works. Uh, it's, it's about the discovery. Comics with an X are going to kind of become their own industry as publishers get in on this indie and adopt it into more mainstream, uh, publishing whole books and collections. And it gets to the point where Robert Crumb uh, decided he didn't like the mainstream corporate culture that America was going into in the 1980s, and so he uh, traded two of his sketchbooks for a villa in France, and that's where he lives and sketches to this day, which, not a bad trade. Also in the 1960s and 70s, we see the birth of cons. So con culture got started actually uh, out of the 1960s with Star Trek. Uh, Star Trek was well-loved, but very expensive to produce, and so it was cut too soon, a lot of people felt. And even so, they would write letters to each other and be publishing about these zines, and people reading these zines decided, well, let's come together and all just talk about Star Trek for a while. And so you have conventions for dentists, why not conventions for fans? And that exploded into a big culture, as all these people who had grown up reading comics uh, collected quite a bit of them, and others had things thrown out, and so they started coming together and trading them. And that would start a whole industry of comic shops itself in the 1970s and 80s. It used to be you would go to the grocery store or the bookstore and pick up your comics, but soon we had specialty shops that were just comics themselves. Through these shops and cons, uh, we got indie creators who would make their own comics. And a lot of these were darker comics than what you could do with mainstream, not approved by the Comics Code Authority, uh, because they didn't care. Uh, they weren't selling on national scales and didn't need to make deals with uh, distributors at grocery stores. Uh, instead, they could just produce what they want. And Dan Sim was among the most successful of those, uh, producing his Canadian Cerebus the Aardvark, uh, which is a very dark, serious kind of Conan-style fantasy uh, except for the heroes in Aardvark. So we see this uh, very rich inking and dark style, so lots of 
uh, pensive looks among the characters, even though one of them's an aardvark and completely ridiculous. Uh, in this page here, we see a bunch of political commentary, uh, as well as a, a reference to Groucho Marx. So this character, Julius, which was Groucho Marx's real name, uh, Julius Marx, is the ruler of the city. Cerebus has saved his son's life, and so he's going to put him in charge of the security forces, uh, which his title will be Kitchen Staff Supervisor. Why not Director of Security Forces? Well, that's what he gave to the Secretary of the Navy. And the Secretary of Navy uh, has a completely different name, because when you're running a bureaucracy, the best way to safeguard your job is to make sure you're the only one who knows how the whole thing works. The humor continues with quick jokes and says... As I said, you'll be in charge of my security forces. You'll make sure that no one assassinates me. If they do, you're fired. Very silly, and yet also very action-packed. And we see all these sword fights and thefts and saving people's lives and murdering other people. and Very exciting take. Um, and nothing that could really be published in mainstream comics, because it's, it's not strictly action, and it's not strictly comedy, so they wouldn't know where to put it on the shelf. But if you meet Dave at a Comic-Con, you can read it and say, Hey, this is great. I'll buy a couple of issues. And he'll says, well, I'm working on some more issues. You can sign up here on my mailing list. Uh, you can prepay now or I'll send you a bill. And through this mailing system, uh, he was able to produce an entire kind of his own industry. And he would soon be working with these comic shops and get uh, small shipments sent in there. And these indies really started gaining a lot of ground by the 1980s. Which would lead us into the success of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles to start the Dark Age. Before we leave off with indie comics, I want to talk about what is considered the most popular and widely published indie comic of all time, which are religious tracts by Jack Chick. So Chick would publish these uh, little comic books. They're only about the size of your hand, and they would comment on what people need to do to be saved, uh, especially in this dark satanic panic time of the 1980s. Uh, here's one of the famous ones tackling Dungeons and Dragons, where we have some kids sitting around the table, uh, playing D&D, &D. but it turns out that D&D &D is more than just at the table. Elfstar, your character, becomes your real persona. So Debbie is taken into a witch's coven because Elfstar is a priestess, and so that's what she has to do. So these tracks warn about Satanism and D&D &D taking over the world and what we can do to stop it, uh, which for the most part, is buy more Chick publications and send those tracks out. Another personal favorite uh, talks about Halloween and these evil kids using their teacher's influence as a witch to sacrifice animals. So with the big spike of evangelical Christianism in the 1980s, uh, Jack Chick found a very wide audience, and they say that more than one billion comics have been published of these and distributed. Uh, he's very much recluse. He doesn't give many interviews, so there's a lot of questions about how many exactly have been published and uh, whether he drew them or hired on people to draw for him. Uh, we don't exactly know, but we do know that there are a lot of these around, and you can certainly check them out online. <laughs> 